our next speaker has the same name of a god, but he's not not the god. <laughs> okay, Odin, uh, uh, Odin Holmes. Uh, I I was trying to convince him to come here to Madrid, and then he told me, "Okay, I will go if you come to my conference." So. I did, and now he's here. And he has been working for many years in C++. He has been working a lot in embedded systems, uh, but he's not going to talk to us about embedded systems. Uh, not that much. The boundaries, the boundaries. I'm going to give you guys some gateway drugs. <laughs> OK. So thank you very much, Odin, for coming. Go. Yes, thanks. Um, hi, I'm Odin. I uh, work for some of these companies, a small group of companies in uh, Bochum, Germany. Um, we, uh, I've been explaining to people all of yesterday what we do, and apparently it's complicated, so I brought some uh, visual aids. Uh, we make uh, monitoring systems for industrial machines or critical infrastructure. This is a small power over ethernet device that you can clip onto cables that go to electric motors and we can do power signature analysis without actually touching the cable. So we do both voltage and current uh, without uh, contacting it. Um, there's another thing we do, we do vibration analysis for uh, plastic injection molds. Um, it's fun, there's lots of microcontrollers, there's also some big data, so I kind of live in two worlds. But uh, we have a conference about microcontroller c plus y stuff. Uh, we love C++, um, especially on microcontrollers, because you can optimize the crap out of it. Um, if you want to come to said conference, it's in March of next year. It's called embo, E-M-B-O dot I-O. Everybody come. Um, but we're going to talk about variants today. Um, you can tell out of all of those companies, we don't have like a marketing department that makes pretty slides, and I'm obviously not capable of that. So, sorry, my slides are going to be ugly. Uh, so, a show of hands, who uses variant in code? Okay, yeah, most of you. Uh, I know there's some people that are uh, kind of starting out, and there's some faces that look a little like this, right? Um, so, I'm going to do a, a quick rundown of what uh, variants are, what some types are, uh, a little refresher to get everybody sort of on the same page, and then we're going to find out why all that's broken. Um, so going back to like the, the, the treacherous sea of the ancient Greeks here, um, in the C language, there's something that's called a union, right? And what a union is, is it's, it can hold one of n different types, right? So there's either an int in it or there's a bool in it not both at the same time, right? And so if we want to uh, put an int in it, we can put an int in it, and then we can print that, because it's obviously great to mix C++ 23 features with legacy C. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> if we want to put a bool in it, we can put a bool in it, and obviously because we love revenge, Diego, <laughs> what happens if we put an int in it and we take a bool out of it? <laughs> Moo ha ha ha, tables have turned. Trick question, I didn't say what my machine was. <laughs> right, so it, so it breaks, it's unsafe, right? And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unsafe, uh, it's an unsafe some type, right? So we want what's called a discriminated union, right? So. This is a C++ 17 feature uh, standard variant. Uh, the meaning of the, the angly bracket type up at the top is it's either an int or it's a string, right? And we're better than the union now because we have templates. Um, <laughs> but because we have templates, we can decide, hey, that char star there, const char star, that's, that's convertible to a string better than it's convertible to an int, right? And so it's going to give us a string in the first line, right? And it's going to give us, it's going to hold an int in the second line. And then we can test, what do you hold? Do you hold a string? Do you hold an int, right? And so now we're type safe. But I would argue that, you know, going through 
all the kinds of things that this could be testing and then uh, reacting accordingly, um, it's still spaghetti code, right? I mean, okay, if we just have two, two types, then it's maybe not spaghetti code yet, but if we had like 100 types, then we'd be testing 100 types one after another, after another, after another. And I don't mean like the yummy kind of spaghetti, right? Like, I mean like the bloated kind of spaghetti, like the, the, the disturbing kind of spaghetti, right? So, <laughs> so what can we do about this? <clears throat> we can visit on the variant. So what exactly does that mean? Well, we, we call this magic function standard visit, and it takes an object of our visitor type and the variant. And so what is the visitor type? So the visitor type is basically just a class that has a bunch of overloaded functions, one for each kind of thing that could be in the variant, right? So if there's an int in there, it's going to call that first member function, right? And if there's a string in there, it's going to call the second member function. It's going to do it automatically, right? And this is less spaghetti code, in my opinion, first of all, because it figures out which one to call an O of N rather than testing every single one of them, although your optimizer may help you a little bit with the other version. But um, it's also a better sort of encapsulation of expertise, right? The, 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 the class visitor can live in the part of the code that knows what to do when visiting on that variant, right? And we can just pass it in and say, I don't know what to do, but this type knows what to do. Let's put it in there and it works. So the way I think about what, a, what visitation is, which is kind of weird, which is okay, because I'm also generally kind of weird, so it, it fits, right? Um, if I have some type T, I don't care what type it is, and I have an overload set called F, I have a bunch of Fs for int and string and whatever, then I can just call F and the compiler figures out which one, right? So I have a compile time known type, and an overload set. And down at the bottom, I would argue that this is actually pretty similar. It's just that the type is known at runtime, right? So I have a value of some type. The type that it is is known at runtime. And then I call my Fs object with the right value, right? So I would argue that this is actually more natural. Uh, Many people disagree, and most of them are smarter than me, so maybe, they, maybe I'm wrong. But that kind of concludes our sort of summary of, of uh, what variant is, right? So we're all kind of on the, on the same level now, right? But the world is not so easy, right? Because there's evil. <laughs> dum, 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 dum. Right? <laughs> so what does evil look like? So this is a perfectly fine, well-behaved class. I mean, it's called Dr. Evil, but we don't want to profile it here, right? It's, 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 it's a nice, well-behaved class, and now it's evil, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, so, so why is this class evil? Well, if we imagine we're assigning one of these to a variant, well, before we copy the new thing into the variant, we have to destroy the old thing in the variant. So we run its destructor, right? We're copying the new thing in, and it throws, right? So if this var variant is local on the stack, then it's going to be destroyed too, so it doesn't really matter. But what if it's like a global? Well, if it's a global, you've got other problems. But what if, it's, what if it's outside the scope of the local function, right? What if it was passed in by reference or something, and you catch you catch the, the exception somewhere along the way, and deal with it, but your variant now doesn't have a value in it, right? We, we destroyed the old one. <laughs> we couldn't put anything new in it, so it's, it's in some undefined state, right? So if we visit on it, what happens, right? And note, like, the bottom line and the line above it are in different functions, right? Because if, if this was just below each other, then, well, the exception would just break every, you know, uh, uh, unwind everything, and, right? So, so if we visit it so on it somewhere else in the code and it's empty, what do we expect to happen, right? 
I mean, this is like a J Diego quiz question again. <laughs> Right? That, that's like an alias to undefined behavior. But um, So we probably want this to be defined in some way, because undefined behavior launches the missiles, right? So that's basically 30 years worth of discussion on this topic, right? There's, there's a better talk on this specifically done by uh, Nevin Lieber at C++ Now, where he goes through the entire standardization process of standard variant and all of the different concerns. And almost all the things people talked about were this problem. <laughs> right? And so out of this, we have boost variant, which I believe is double buffered. So it has two, takes twice as much space, and a little more runtime. And so it doesn't actually destroy the old thing. It tries to construct the new one. And if it fails at doing that, well, it just keeps pointing to the old one. <laughs> right? Um, I guess you can get into, theoretically get into problems if you're copying it somewhere and both of, right? So in, in, in that case, uh, you still have a, have a situation where you don't know what to do. And then there's standard variant, which uh, throws an exception if it's valueless by exception. <laughs> so there's like a new exception type called valueless by exception, and it gets thrown if you try and visit or access a variant which doesn't have any value in it. And that's not fun for me because I don't turn on exceptions. Because <laughs> I can't, because my RAM is full if I turn them on, because the emergency buffer is often bigger than my RAM, <laughs> right? So I can't. <laughs> and then there's Q variant, which is basically a, a boost any masquerading as a variant, as many uh, QT things do. So the, you, with the Q variant, the thing is actually on the heap, which kills your runtime, but so does QT, so that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> And then there's boost variant 2, which is actually interesting. Um, boost variant 2 will construct the first type in your list of types that the variant can be that has a default constructor. Right? So if I put an int and a string in there, it's just going to make an int if something throws. <laughs> right? Well, int and a string and have Dr. Evil, because right? you need something that throws. But yeah, it's just going to construct the first one that has a default constructor. And if none of them have a default constructor, then I think it throws. But uh, you can basically build whatever action you want um, in a boost variant too. So takeaways, yay, dim off. I think he, he solved that problem, at least as far as my use cases need. However, <laughs> I don't really care, because that's not the problems I have. <laughs> right? I, I, have, I have other problems. Uh, I write a lot of generic code on the bigger side of things, and sometimes on the microcontrollers. But uh, if you write generic code, you have you know some function f down at the bottom on the right. Function f we calling function f, and we're visiting on its return, right? And so yeah, we know this could be you know probably success case, error case, one of the two. Visit on it, figure out which one. It seems like it'll work, right? There isn't really a problem in F, except for my off by one error. Um, the, uh, but the F is still taking in this you know, error type, which is coming from the operating system. So depending on what operating system you are on, that might actually be int, right? So T and U might be the same type. And so this kind of breaks generic code, right? I mean, do I want the thing one or the thing two? Well, what if they're the same type? Well, OK, then I can't visit anymore. And there's like this fallback thing where you can call get and then put in a number. And then so you can get like the alternative one or the alternative two. And But then that's we're back at like the, the odd man eating spaghetti, right? Uh, if, we're, if we're checking which, which, which type, you know, which, which index it could be. And then I have other problems, because I don't have a lot of memory, right? If I have a buffer, and I'm in place into this buffer, and then I visit on the buffer when I take stuff out, well, I don't even have a copy constructor. I don't care, right? <laughs> but I would very much like my bool to na not take up as much space as my array of 1,000 longs, right? 
And theoretically, that could work, right? Like, it's, it's, it, it's not unimplementable, but it doesn't really work with standard variant because standard variant has some, you know, fixed layout. So kind of taking a step back, or many steps back of, OK, I'm just complaining here. Well, shut up and build a better one, right? <laughs> and so what, yeah, what, what, what do I actually need? And how do I figure out how to build it? And I'm a big fan of Richard Feynman, so we're just going to use the Feynman algorithm, right? Everybody know what the Feynman algorithm is? Nobody? OK, first step of the Feynman algorithm, write the question down. Second step, think real hard. Third step, write down the answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is not just a joke, though, because there's some semantic value to this, right? I mean, there's some students in the room, and this is a, I mean, this is a bit of a do as I say, not as I do, but don't forget that one <laughs> in some publicly accessible forum, right? Like, if you thought really hard, put it on GitHub, right? And the other takeaway from this is most people think this is the hard part, and sometimes it is. But often it's actually that, figuring out what the actual question is that's the hard part, right? So I built something that works on my machine, and the question is whether it's generic enough to work on a bunch of other problems. Right? And how do we get it generic enough to not just work on my machine with my work uh, use case? Right? So let's get really generic. Ah, uh, no, nah, it's a little too generic. Um, how about it works on every sum type? Right? So re regardless of layout, regardless of, uh, um, everybody know what a, like a sum type is? I've been throwing around this, this uh, yeah, maybe uh, a couple of people. So. Some types like a fancy word for the by the you know made up by category theorists to prove they're smarter than you and it, it's a valid proof uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, so if we think back to the struct or the union in on the first or the fourth slide uh, it can be either bool or u and eight t right so it can be either one of the two hundred and fifty six different possibilities of the u and eight t or the two possibilities of the bool right. So it's the sum of all the possibilities are the states that it can be in, right? If it were a tuple of bool, and right, it'd be a product type. It'd be two times 256, right? And so that's why we talk about sum types and, and, and product types, right? So uh, everything that can fit on a plate, <laughs> well, that's a sum type. That's an open sum type because there's no end to things that could fit on a plate, right? Everything that fits on a plate at a specific restaurant, well, that's a closed sum type. There's a menu, <laughs> there's a list of all the things that could come on your plate, right? Plates a variant, plates an open sum type, uh, a closed sum type. We can't really work on open sum types. I mean, well, you know, that's that's for the world of virtual functions, right? So we're gonna we're gonna work on all of the close. Uh, 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 we want to be able to visit on objects that represent a closed sum type but we don't want fixed layout, right? For example, I'm often in the situation where I'm getting stuff that's coming to me over a wire, right? I don't control that layout. <laughs> or I'm getting messages from the operating system. That's a variant. Like, there's a, there's a countable number of things that that could be in the first byte, depending on any sane operating system will have like the first byte or word tell you what it is, right? And you have then different subcategories probably of operating system messages. It's a variant of all the possible operating system messages, but I don't control the layout, right? So if I don't control the layout and if I want to support a bunch of different things, then I'm gonna have to make a toolbox of composable pieces <laughs> with which you can build visitation yourself, right? Because I don't know what the layout of your types are, right? I mean, with all the template magic in the world, I, I can't know your type, right? Um, <clears throat> so if we, if we uh, decompose this, 
We have, you know, first step, discriminate. Basically, that means figure out what type it is, right? If it's an operating system message, well, that's probably the first word. If it's uh, some protocol, that's probably, you know, maybe the, the, the first value. Maybe it's coming after the length. If it's a protocol designed by Bosch, it's somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> but it's somewhere, right? There's some way to figure out what type of packet this is, what type of message this is, what type of object this is. And I don't know, but you do, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and then we have to go from this number, you know, this index number of what, what type is in there that we know at runtime, and we have to go back to compile time <laughs> to be able to call one of the functions in the overload set. And this is the hard part. This is the reason why there aren't just a bazillion variant implementations. There are only kind of four notable ones that I put on the slide. There's probably a few more, but there's, you know, there's not a variant implementation in every code base because this is kind of hard. Um, but only one person has to implement that if you can decompose it right, right? So discriminator, that's, that's the user, right? Run down to compile time, that's the library. Type conversion, you could maybe want to do fancy stuff, right? If you have nested variants or if you have nested, uh, uh, um, right, you know, protocols that run on top of each other where one wraps the other, wraps the other, wraps the other, while conceptually to me, that's a nested variant, right? If you want to do that, you probably have to uh, top level figure out, hey, this is, you know, uh, this is some packet. I don't know what's in it, but I know it goes from byte four to byte 37. <laughs> Well, here's a pointer from, you know, here's a, here's a, here's a span from four to 37 and you figure it out <laughs> next level up the protocol. I know nothing about, right? So type conversion could be library, could be user. And then the visitor itself, well, that has to be user, right? Only the user knows what to do. That's kind of the point, <laughs> right? So, you know, naive implementation would do this, right? We have a converter, which converts the type of, you know, some whatever's in the, in, the, um, in the bytes, right? It converts it to whatever type the visitor visits on. We have discriminator. It takes some type, figures out which index is, is, is active, right? You know, what kind of some type are you of the, all the different types that you could be? Converter takes the result of discriminator and the sum type. Conceptually, this is what I want to do, but because of the constraints of the language, I can't quite do it this way, right? Because the converter can't return different types based on some runtime known value, right? But we'll get to that in a minute, right? So, so in this example, we have a sum type, right? So, you know, it's, it's got an int and then it's got some buffer of data. And, you know, the, this type doesn't know what object is in that buffer, hence it's some type, right? <laughs> so if I want to implement a discriminator, well, that's trivial, right? Implementing a true discriminator on a standard variant is also trivial. You just, you know, get the index out. Um, could be as complicated as you want. If it's OS messages, well, it's going to be probably more complicated, right? Converter, well, if I, if I get my some type t, right? And I uh, also take as a uh, function parameter a compile time known constant, right? So an integral constant is a type which represents a number in the type system. If I take both of those, well, I just have, you know, have to figure out in the type list which type is at index i. And this is the point where I can't really explain how this works within the scope of this talk, right? I've done other talks on this. Uh, the code dive one is probably the best. Um, for the sake of this talk, you can either have a hunch of what I'm doing here, <laughs> or perfect abstraction, it's unicorns in the compiler that do whatever I tell them to do. And to communicate with the unicorns, you have to use the unicorn call syntax. And unicorn call syntax is denoted by the pointy horn brackets, right? 
So if something's in the pointy horn brackets, <laughs> we're talking to the unicorns, right? So lots of pointy horn brackets there. Up there, the integral constant, okay, pointy horn brackets around the i, that means the i is known at compile time, right? So there's one more thing we have to do, uh, uh, um, sorry, we, we, we ran into the problem that the converter can't return different types, but it can call something forward with those different types, right? So we kind of have to compose those two. And in this compose function, we can kind of hide our runtime to compile time that we're going to build, right? And so to figure out how to make the runtime to compile time, we have to kind of understand on sort of a more general level how things actually work in the compiler, right? So I would argue you only really have three kinds of things in C++ or in most languages, right? You have the type system. The type system is kind of bookkeeping on the part of the compiler. You have data. Data is just bits, right? So data without a type, oh, that's bits, right? Sean Perrin has a lovely example where he gives you like eight bits and it's like a signed integer from uh, <laughs> minus seven, to, right? You can interpret it however you want, right? Without the type. So the type basically specifies what the data represents. And then you have subroutines, which again is a fancy word to prove that other people are smarter than me, so I stole their word to pretend I'm also smart. Um, subroutines are basically just strings of assembler, so a function is a subroutine. Uh, coroutines are different, right? So that, that's the distinction. You have coroutines and subroutines. Subroutines is just a string of assembler, right? And so essentially, the types decide which subroutine gets called for which conceptual operation on two pieces of data. Right? So if I have, uh, if I have a, a pointer and an int and I add them, well, that's going to do one thing. Right? And if I have two strings and I add them, well, that's going to do something else. It's going to call a different subroutine, right? because the type of the data is different. So when you compile it, the types go away. <laughs> right? We just have data and subroutines. Right? So if we want to get back to types, well, where do the types go, right? The types are, are, are somewhat analogous to positions in code, right? If I'm in this subroutine, well, then this data that I have, that's an int. If I'm in this other subroutine, well, that data that I have, that's a bool, right? Same bit representation on most machines, uh, but the interpretation is different based on where I am, right? So I have to turn. I have to codify type information into location, and then I can get the type information back, essentially. Right? So one way to do this, <laughs> make an array of pointers. <laughs> right? Array of pointers is basically an array of positions. <laughs> and function pointers is just a position in code. Right? Um, so here I'm brute force implementing out OK, so if you call pointer location 0, well, you're going to get a compile time in 0 and, and the rest of your function. If you call next one, you're going to get 1. If you call the next one, you're going to get 2. And then I can just index into that and call it with uh, my uh, um, function that I want to call. So that's the visitor in this case, right? And the sum type. And it'll just do it, right? <laughs> uh, I, I can also do this programmatically because I don't want to instantiate it out. Right? So I'm a type that somebody handily passed an index sequence to with a pack of compile time known indexes. right? And then getting the return type, I'm kind of cheating. I'm just looking at what's the return type of calling the function with the first alternative. I probably should do more checking, but that doesn't fit on a slide anymore, right? I'm making a static constant expert member array <laughs> of function pointers. And then you see the three dots. That's, that's called pack expansion. That's another way of talking to the unicorns that say, hey, unicorns, build one of these for every one of the compile time known indexes, right? 
So it's going to make one for uh, um, for each one, and I can have an array of length, however many types I have, and then I can, from outside, index into this and call the right one. Right? Oops, I had pointers. I could have used this to help everyone, but I forgot. Uh, <laughs> So instantiating this type, right, I have to get my number of, compile, uh, you know, number of alternatives, I have to get that from somewhere, right? And since this is not a variant, since this is something that the user made, right, I, uh, um, I get it from the return type of the uh, um, discriminator. D, right? So here I basically say, hey, D's return type, what's the compile time value associated with your type, <laughs> right? That's where I make this pack of eyes and then use that to make my magic array and then use my magic array to uh, call the right function. Right? That means as a user, if I'm writing a discriminator, I have to use this magic type to talk to the unicorns, right? Because the unicorns need to know that there's three possible things that I could return. Because I'm returning an int, well, that's a lot of possible things, right? I don't want to make that big of a const expert array. So that's basically the one thing that the user needs to use without understanding how it works. And beyond that, you can just build a visitor over essentially anything, right? That you can call in the way I like to call it, <laughs> right? So conceptually, in S, your sum type, you have three different things it could be. I don't know how to make them, but your Lambda does, right? And I don't know what your visitor is, but you put it into my function, and I'm just going to call whatever it is that, that, uh, um, that corresponds to that index, right? So we can actually also uh, abstract away these static casts, right? Because this is, we want to be more type safe, right? Oops, sorry, different example first. <laughs> um, remember back to the example where we had the same type and we couldn't visit on two things of the same type. Well, now that we have a toolbox of stuff, there's nothing stopping us from making a tuple of visitors <laughs> and have them just correspond to the index that came out of the discriminator, right? So if I have a left node or a right node, well, those are the same types, right? <laughs> but if you want to visit on that node in the tree and you have give me two lambdas, <laughs> this is what you do on the left side, this is what you do on the right side, that, that'll work here, right? Or if, uh, I mean, in my concrete use case, it's usually, uh, you know, which, which peripheral is it, which buffer is it, which you know, very microcontroller -y stuff, but, but it works kind of across the board. And as, now that we're working on indexes rather than types in visitation, they compose better, right? <laughs> I can take two variants and put them in the same storage and just cat the tuples and compose the, the uh, um, compose the uh, discriminators, and I can, I can collapse two different tuples into one that share an index, and it works, right? I don't have to make a variant of variants. Right? Uh, it, you know, it, you, you need some plumbing to do that, right? But, I mean, my use case is often not quite as sexy. It's maybe I want the discriminator to not be four bytes. I want it to be one, <laughs> right? <laughs> but 
yeah so 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 we can we can we can make sort of uh two visitor wrappers that do the uh um uh uh conversion for us right either you know one one of them basically uh um one of them basically uh does the visitation by index and will uh um just index into the tuple <laughs> uh and one that will do all the converting for you and basically act like uh, um, a standard visit, convert the type. And so you don't necessarily have to write that either, right? So it works on a lot of sort of use cases that are conceptually a variant but don't quite work, right? Like, you know, I. This was my original motivating example, slideified, right? I have different USB endpoints, <laughs> and I'm doing mostly the same thing depending on endpoint, but uh, um, uh, part of what I'm doing is different though because depending on which endpoint I'm at, I'm being talked to over a different protocol, right? So the protocol shouldn't know anything about what endpoint they're running on. Protocols shouldn't know anything about each other, right? Protocol should be just this 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 uh, um, uh, strategy pattern that fulfills the in, uh, interface of you've got data, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I need to be able to compose them together into something that will work on uh, my you know USB driver, right? And I can I can do that with this toolbox, right? There's probably the the uh, um, the example that would sort of uh, um, where 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 which I think would be the test if it's abstract enough is I would like to be able to build a composition of um, composition of uh, either some object struct or int or string or array or whatever to represent JSON packets <laughs> and then use the uh, um, discriminator and the uh, converter to actually parse the JSON packet, <laughs> at least the ones that I understand, and then just be able to visit on some JSON string, and it will call the right function with the right uh, um, uh, variables that are converted, right? Or it will fail. I mean, I'd have to put in some, I couldn't parse it, uh, possibility, right? But if you can write that, I haven't written that yet, but I think it'd be possible, probably not super performant, but uh, it'd be, you know, once you wrote, written the infrastructure, it'd be hard to get wrong, right? So I think, I mean, I, I haven't solved other people's problems. I've mostly solved my problems so far, but I think I've figured out the right way to think about the problem, right? Like, you know, visitation and the memory layout of the of the uh, um, uh, variant are two different things, right? And visitation should be a wrapper around stuff that's visitable, right? <clears throat> and you know, we we have uh, concepts like variant like and tuple like in the in the library uh, in the standard library already. Um, this is probably not something that should go into the standard, uh, but uh, it's probably something that could go into something like Boost. Uh, but uh, I think uh, viewing things that are conceptually some types as some types and then writing the code accordingly is probably the right strategy because, I mean, I've, I, I've done some consulting work and I've seen a lot of code bases and event handling is never clean code, ever. I don't know if anyone has like show of hands. Oh yeah, my OS event handler is beautiful. Uh, <laughs> tell me how you do it, right? Because it has to be performant, so you can't really go too crazy with you know virtual functions or anything. And so that's kind of off the table. And it's certainly one of the uh, use cases where you're composing a bunch of things from conceptually different parts of the code base, right? So you're breaking encapsulation usually because I have to take knowledge out of that far away part of the code to be able to figure out uh, 
whether these events are things that it wants to consume or not, right? And so, yeah, it's really brittle code. And I think this might be a way to, uh, um, to be able to not break encapsulation in that, uh, you know, encapsulation of expert T's, not encapsulation of, you know, private data -y stuff, although that somewhat maps to each other, um, such that different parts of the code base can, can write their own filters on input and they're, they're visitors, and then you can compose them in the middle to form one super discriminator and one super visitor, right? So yeah, that's, that's uh, my talk. Um, I finished a little early, which was unexpected. So lots of questions. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. You mentioned that this may be worth uh, putting into Boost. Have you thought about proposing it for Boost? Um, yes, and then I looked at my calendar and got really depressed. <laughs> uh, I, have you thought about, like, I don't know, mentoring someone to do it? Or? I, maybe, yeah. Um, I, I, uh, um, I think most of what needs to be done is... Uh, a lot of documentation and then implementing the metaprogramming part with a metaprogramming library that's in Boost, but it's actually not a lot of metaprogramming. Um, yeah, okay. yeah, seems, um, seems doable, yeah. Yeah, I, if someone's interested, talk to me. Uh, um, I, uh, do you want to? <laughs> not, not, not me personally, but I, I think we should have a conversation offline yeah. and, and determine how, how to do that. Is this like, um, could this go into boost variant two? Because I, I, I don't think we should have boost variant three. You know. Well, uh, it might not be the right idea to name it variant. Maybe uh, composable visitors or something. Yeah. Because it, I mean, it doesn't handle a lot of the problems of variant, right? Like, you know, I, I completely sidestep the whole train wreck that is assignment, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's just about visitation. So. Yeah, or or variant adopter, or you know, was, some was basic something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it does like you could you could write a trivial discriminator to be able to use this to visit over variants uh, by index, for example, which variant two doesn't do. Okay. Well, let's have this conversation offline. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk again. Um, one question, you have put a, um, an example when you have, for example, an integer and the other was like a typical enum, who is yeah. also an integer. And you, 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 you say that this is complicated to if both of them are the same type, in, 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 the, in, in they are both the same type. In that case, what can, what can, what can you do? Can you do something to... Um, to work with them oh, easily? yes, 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 yes. Uh, I know which example you're talking about. Uh, Some obscure enum was something like that. Yes. Before Feynman came and saved us. Um, yes, here, I think. Yes. Yeah, yes, here. Da, da, da. Here. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, this, this uh, uh, um, uh, to clarify, this uh, obscure os error type, that's not an enum, it's a, an alias. Right. Okay. Uh, oftentimes, it'll just be a type def to int as well. Right. So uh, they actually actually are the same type. Right. Okay. Uh, um, yeah. This is going to be a compiler error uh, um, when that happens, which is better than it being not a compiler error, I guess. Uh, but uh, yeah, the only real thing you can do in that case is go back to index. Uh, or, I mean, if you're actually using it as the error case, then you stood expected if you have a compiler that's new enough, right? But uh, um, maybe if this was easier, we wouldn't have needed stood expected. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, you have to you have to uh, um, do the the original sort of holds alternative test way at the beginning. Um, uh, there we go. Um, and check, is it alternative one, is it alternative two, and then do get 
instead of the int here in get, you can also put a number, right? Uh, so you can get the thing at index zero or the thing at index one. That, that's, that's how to solve it. But it breaks the whole generic code thing though, right? So uh, yeah, I mean, with, with my implementation, you would, uh, um, in generic code context, you would take the index as well, <laughs> right? And the type, okay, well, that's nice that they converted the type to the right type for me, but it's the index that really decides which overload is called, right? Uh, yeah, so um, when I look at this, uh, uh, to me, the obvious solution is uh, that uh, when you use types, meaning you kind of use some kind of object orientation, yeah, it is not correct to use the same time for different objects. So if you say you have an error, uh, it's not really right to use int type for the error. Yes. So if I would have to solve it, uh, let's say using standard variant or uh, any yeah. other variant uh, that you have uh, uh, um, mentioned. I would just, uh, let's say, uh, create a type with an int in it and, uh, yeah, and then I kind of uh, uh, yeah, solve the issue or maybe in your terms it will be, I avoid the issue. So yes. can you comment on that? I mean, Thanks. that's essentially what Haskell does, right? You have uh, strong type aliases and then you can, right? The problem is that, I mean, conceptually you're, you're correct, but legacy code doesn't care, <laughs> right? And uh, um, in the case of the, the, uh, the alias um, to the type, uh, it may, I may not be aware of a different system where these actually are the same type, right? On my machine, it may be an unsigned int, and so everything works, right? And then I, I switch operating systems, and then it's a different type def, right? I mean, you just provide a, a, a wrapper around the error, right? Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, one could do that. That's that's sometimes hard to explain to like onboarded people, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it 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 does it does solve that use case. Um, it doesn't solve the layout problem, right? But yeah, you are you are right that that there are other ways to solve that and still keep visitation. But then, like, okay, I guess it'd be com implicitly convertible to the underlying type. Yeah, you could you could make it pretty ergonomic. Yeah. Um, yesterday we saw a talk about uh, MB units with, in fact, changes like an int to a specific type like yeah. height or yeah. width. In that in that case, can that be used to differentiate the different error types of different systems? Uh, essentially, yeah. I mean, that's, that's somewhat of what, what he was getting similar, at. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, um, I mean, it's generally a good idea to use uh, the type system to uh, disambiguate different, conceptually different things that under the hood are all just ints, right? Uh, um, I actually have a, a, a funny antidote to that, to that point. Uh, back when I was young and naive and hadn't been to a conference yet, um, <laughs> I, uh, I implemented an interface that had a packet ID and a protocol ID, and they were both ints. And so on one spot, I switched them, right? And the problem was that that was uh, protocol ID 2, and it was the answer. And protocol ID 2 was like open a pipe protocol, and so it would say, hey, can I open this pipe? That's packet ID 1. And the answer would be, yes, you can. And that's packet ID 2. And that's all that you communicated over protocol ID 2, right? <laughs> Except in China. <laughs> so yeah, this was for a vehicle diagnostic system. And so there was some special edition of some VW that in China that would go, wait a minute. OK, now the pipe's open. And so that was packet ID 3, and everything broke, right? And so I almost went to China <laughs> to figure out what was wrong because I didn't use the type system properly. So if things are conceptually different, make your own type because then the compiler will figure this out and you won't bang your head against the wall for two weeks, right? I mean, how many types could I have typed out in that two weeks of time that that cost me? Lots, right? <laughs> and following on that, uh, would this indexing um, array of functions would have solved that problem by calling with a new 
Well, I would I would be uh, I would be using the index in the variant rather than the uh, um, the type, right? And then it wouldn't bite me anymore. Um, and I'm sure there's somebody in here that's curious. I tried it out on Godbolt, and the three major compilers will turn a const expr static array of function pointers into inline, <laughs> right? It, it all goes away. It's essentially, uh, uh, at least on uh, Clang, I believe it's indiscriminatable from a switch statement, <laughs> right? In, in the assembler uh, when optimized. So, yeah. Thank you. More questions? Over here? Oh, sorry. So, you, you've talked about um, the layout problem. And yeah. I, I want to clarify whether I understood it correctly that basically what you're doing is I don't solve this, I leave this for my client for the user to solve it. Yes. Including lifetime issues, including um, m meaning variant provides on top of the visitation discriminator and logic, it provides lifetime for the object that is inside. The object that you're visiting on, essentially. Um, well, that's, that's one reason why I like the call syntax version, because you pass that in, <laughs> right? So that the, you know, the, the underlying storage of whatever you're visiting on is a input parameter to the function call operator of the uh, composed visitor discriminator thing, right? And so that's, you know, lifetime of that object and everything that derives from it is mostly on you, <laughs> right? You pass something in, you get it later, your, your thing, right? I mean, yes, we, you know, we had a talk yesterday that everything, every, everything is broken, we can't have nice things. So yes, there are ways to, to, to break that, but uh, I don't think it's, I mean, I, I, I think that it's orthogonal to the, the implementation, essentially, right? Because I'm just passing things through that you gave to me, <laughs> right? Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Doesn't look like. Okay. So okay, I guess thank you very much. <clears throat>